Assalamu alaikum, dear physicians. Welcome you all in today's lecture series organized by CG Study Group. Today is our 40th lecture, and today's topic is ECG for fun. And as usual, the fun part of ECG is always going to be presented by our respected and most liked teacher, Dr. Rafiq Ahmed, sir. Before starting our lecture, I request Professor Abdul Wadi Chaudhary, sir, to say some words about Rafiq Ahmed, sir, and then we proceed. Wadi, sir, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, everybody, and good evening. Today, we are going to have some pleasant, beautiful ECG from Professor Rafiq Ahmed, sir. Rafiq, sir, I think is well known to everybody who is joining here today. Still then I have to say a few words. He's somebody who stays in USA far, far away, but always continue having the dream of any Bangladeshi people in his mind to enlighten this country, to improve the country, to serve the country. That's the dream he always bears in his mind and that he executes by his action. He's the founder of electrophysiology of this country. And for that, he has to sacrifice a lot. He spend a lot of uh, work hour, have to spend a lot of time in this country, come to this country again and again, and have to bring the experts, the logistics and everything to start this electrophysiology service in this country. When we started this ECG study group and he joined it, it enlivened us like anything. And the most important thing about him is that he's capable of making things very uh, pleasant, very fun filled, very, uh, I should say, enlightening. So today, again, we are going to have a beautiful lecture from Dr. Rafi Kahmed, consultant uh, cardiac electrophysiologist in Medister Heart and Vascular Institute in Maryland, USA. But before that, his most important, uh, I should say, for uh, joy is that he is a Bangladeshi original electrophysiologist. It's the most important thing. Thank you, sir, for joining us. And we are waiting for your uh, beautiful lecture. Sir, you have to unmute yourself, sir. OK. Um, yes. Good, uh, good, good, afternoon. good evening, and salam uh, to, uh, to everybody. Uh, I want to ask um, Arun a quick question just to confirm. I heard that Siddhartha passed away. Is that true, Arun? Who is Siddhartha? Cardiologist in Nepal, Siddhartha Majumdar. Siddhartha Majumdar, cardiologist from Nepal. I'm not aware of. Somebody, him. okay, anyway, somebody mentioned that. Anyway, so today's lecture was supposed to be uh, by um, Athar Ali, but Athar's mom, um, mother is very um, sick in the hospital, so please pray for her. Um, I mean, we are all in that region passing through a difficult time. And I hope we will recover from this. So um, I'm going to do, um, because Atar's lecture is supposed to be anatomy and physiology, I'm going to touch a little bit uh, on the, the electrophysiology mechanism of arrhythmia. Um, so I. Is there, can we get a volunteer to uh, tell me this about this ECG? Because I didn't put questions. I thought that. Tushar, can we have somebody? Uh, sir, I like to request all Maski yes. sir to have someone from Nepal yes. to participate. Maski sir. Okay. So can I ask, uh, can you unmute Bisal Sresta? Bisal Sresta? Unmute. Rivu? Rivu, please unmute Vishal Shrestha. Okay, Vishal. Uh, yes. 
Vishal, you want to say something? Is he on mute? Anybody else? Can you unmute Bishal? Sir, uh, sir, is he Dr. Bishal Sreshtha? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm bringing him. Yes, sir, he has been allowed to talk. He has to okay, unmute. Michelle, can, you, can you tell me about this ECG, please? Sir, should I, should I continue? No, no, yeah, yes, Bishal sir. is there. Okay. Am I audible, hey, sir? Yeah, yes. Yes, yes. Mr. Vishal, you are audible. Yes, sir. This is a this is a two-way lip ECG showing uh, group beating. Uh, first initial uh, six beats are uh, around at the rate of around sixty beats per minute, and later on the rate is uh, quite high, around at the rate of one fifty beats per minute, one twenty, one fifty beats per minute. The okay. P wave is present in all the leads preceding QRS. Uh, we can see uh, uh, white P wave in lead two, especially mm -hmm. in the initial part, whereas the P yeah. wave is uh, different in uh, different later later parts. So yes. <clears throat> there is multiple uh, uh, multiple uh, morphology of P waves. Okay. And the axis uh, axis is uh, left uh, right axis around uh, minus forty five degree. And then uh, the QRS PR interval is uh, PR interval is okay. QRS interval is okay. QRS axis is uh, right axis, and then uh, we can see Q waves in V1 and V2. However, there is uh, no other Q waves and no other ST changes. QT seems to be prolonged on the later part of the ECG. Probably not. Okay, thank, not thank you. So I think you have summarized it. I, my question. There is, of course, evidence of left hand, but you did a wonderful job. So if people who are listening, please look at this, that what he did is he did not just focus on the abnormal finding. He described the ECG and talked about all the pertinent features, including the presence of key wave in the anterior chest lead. My question to you now is, so the P wave here is V1 biphysics, so this is sinus. Even though it looks multiple morphology, but if you look at lead V1, it's upright morphology. So what, what is the reason for this tachycardia? What will you diagnose this as? As the, uh, the P wave has morphology has changed from, uh, uh, from before tachycardia, then after tachycardia. So I'll consider it as, it is a uh, uh, supraventricular type, sir. So I have an inappropriate oh. sinus tachycardia or atrial tachycardia. Okay. Between the so okay. Between inappropriate sinus tachycardia and atrial tachycardia, which one would you take? So I'll take for atrial tachycardia. Good. So the reason you are taking atrial tachycardia, because if it were sinus tachycardia, for whatever, it cannot suddenly jump to this rate, number one. Of course, by broad definition, this is supraventricular tachycardia. Now if you look at the morpho uh, relation between P and QRS, this is a long RP tachycardia. A long RP tachycardia, there are two diagnoses. One is atrial tachycardia, and one will be possibly a typical AV node reentry. However, if you look at it here, and look at this T wave, and this one, there is distortion. So probably there is a P wave here. So it starts with a P wave. So this is most likely and actually take it together. Now, my question to you is, why did it happen? What is the mechanism? You don't have to be correct, just give me a guess. Probably the patient has a left atrial enlargement, sir. Some yeah. mitral or disease. Okay, sure. I mean, we don't know, I don't, I don't have a history of this patient. I did not put the age or anything, so I have to be fair to you. So the question is, why did it happen? <clears throat> is it suddenly, some focus in the atrium became faster. Is it a re-entry? All those are the mechanisms that we're going to, thank you, thank you very much. So thank you, sir. What, hap what happens is, um, 
automaticity. Automaticity is a uh, can cause tachycardia. And the simplest example of automaticity is sinus tachycardia. If I am sitting down, my heart rate will be 60. If I start running, my heart rate will go up and that will be an enhanced automaticity, automaticity of a normal sinus node. Or I can have a totally abnormal focus somewhere in the heart, which can start beating. This is the action potential of the sinus node. You see, this is a sinusoidal wave. This is me minimum diastolic potential. This is threshold potential. You don't have to remember this, but just threshold potential means that if the cell reaches that level, it will then generate an action potential. We can have increased atomicity because the threshold has gone down. If it is here, then it will start earlier and we'll have tachycardia. Or the diastolic potential goes up and we will reach threshold much quicker, it will be faster. Or the slope changes of the phase four and that's automaticity. In inappropriate sinus tachycardia, this is the most likely mechanism and drug like evabradine actually works here. So if you, there is a popular drug evabradine, it is a funny current that causes this. And that's, so it's, it's important to understand these things and really use uh, drugs appropriately. And uh, for the newer generation of doctors, please remember, we, when we became doctors, we did not know the mechanism cellular level. There is a lot of cellular research going on and they are finding out the target location of action of these drugs. So this is enhanced automaticity that it can be physiologically, it can be pathological. Physiologically, sinus tachycardia. This is an example. Um, of a patient, 51 year old, uh, heart rate 123. You can see there is a P wave before each QRS complex. The P wave is upright in lead two, three AVF, lead one, and probably it's difficult to see here, but probably biophysics. So this is a patient with sinus tachycardia. This is an enhanced automaticity, but this is a physiological enhanced automaticity. I don't know the circumstance in which this patient was, but this is most likely a sinus tachycardia. I always tell people one thing about if the patient is on telemetry monitor, if your patient's heart rate is 123 for 15, 20, 30 minutes, that cannot be sinus tachycardia. Please remember sinus tachycardia, even in the sickest patient, will have some inherent variation. So what are the enhanced automaticity tachycardias that we can have supraventricular premature beat? We can have ventricular premature beat, we can have atrial tachycardia, and there are certain ventricular tachycardia due to enhanced automaticity that um, among them are RVOT, VT, LVOT, VT. And this is way to do it. Actually in electrophysiology study, there is a way to differentiate. It's, a lot of times it's very difficult to di differentiate um, these tachycardias, whether it is automatic focus or is it a re-entry. But if you study them, uh, one of the simple way would be if you give a drug like isoprenaline that induces tachycardia that is most probably enhanced automaticity. On the other hand, if you use uh, electrical extra stimulus technique, most probably it's a re-entry tachycardia. Um, so um, anybody for this one, please. Uh, Tushar, can you get somebody to do this? You want uh, Dr. Krishna, Krishna Chandra yes. Adhikari? Sure. Can you unmute Krishna Chandra Adhikari? Okay, sir. Just give me a moment. Krishna? Yes, sir. Okay. Hi, this is Dr. Ahmed. So what do you think of this arrhythmia? Start with the top step. To speak. Dr. Krishna, it's a, it's a rhythm strip, uh, a rhythm strip uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, regular white is uh, irregular uh, white tachycardia. Probably, sir, uh, it's a uh, torsadi point is. Sure. And what is it? So 
Why did you say torsad? So there is a differing amplitude of the ventricular complexes. Exactly. Uh, so what happens with torsad? Some of them will look down. Like here, if you look, I'm sorry, um, let me get the pointer here. Like this one, looking down and then changes looking up. And there is another thing that supports it. What do you think of the QT interval? QT interval in the previous, uh, uh, in the early part is a prolonged, sir. Prolonged, so prolonged QT. So what do you think is the mechanism of this? Arrhythmia, why did it happen? Mechanism. Yes. All right, you don't have to, but. So this is after depolarization. And stay with us, please. When yes, we have action potential in the ventricle, you see these are triggered by something. Ventricle normally will not generate. Ventricle will follow the atrium or if there is a PVC or something, automatic focus. So, but this action potential can sometimes generate after depolarization. And this is linked up to this one. And there are some of them are called early after depolarization and some are delayed. And so if let's say this, there is a delayed after depolarization, if the amplitude is big enough that it can generate an impulse. Like this one, early after depolarization, and it is big enough, it can produce a complex. And look at this. If you think about it, here is the wave where is the ending of that early action potential. And then there is the impulse that started from here. And that's early after depolarization. That's the mechanism of long QT, a drug induced um, torsade or long QT due to bradycardia for this patient. I'm not going to talk, uh, thank you very much. I'm not thank going to talk about the treatment. So please remember this, that delayed after depolarization and early after depolarization. And depending, why is it important? It is important because how to treat this. What's happening, let's look at picture B. Action potential is prolonged and that is causing this action. So if these patients come to me and I think this is VF or VT and I give them amiodarone, it will make it worse. So if it is after depolarization related, it will make it worse. In delayed after depolarization, if there is an offending drug that will have to be stopped. And this actually is a calcium current dependent. That's why a lot of times calcium channel blocker will prevent in digital structure. This is potassium current dependent. So after the, there can be different types, phase, phase two, this is calcium, inward calcium current, phase three is potassium current and delayed after depolarization is the late one. And what are the types? Early after the long QT arrhythmia, all of them are early after delayed, perfect example is digital H toxicity. And so they produce atrial tachycardia by delayed after depolarization. Um, and then oxalate, idioventricular arrhythmia, reperfusion arrhythmia, all those are related. And some RVO to VT are actually delayed. And this is a unique one. Catecholamergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. We used to think this is a rare entity, but it is not. It is, again, this, is cal this one actually is very much dependent on calcium current and there is calcium overload inside the cell. Sir, now, uh, just as a, sir, just as a question, I have a question, if you don't mind. Yes. Sir, why the catecholaminergic polymorphicity is more common in children? Um, is there I don't any know. mechanism? I don't know. Um, I, I'm not sure, is it, we, we see very rare young people because these are idiopathic ventricular arrhythmia. Um, so I don't know why it is more common in um, children mm -hmm. or is it possible that this arrhythmia is a genetic condition and basically yes. uh, the one that we see as an adult and they are diagnosed early on. That probably is the most likely explanation. We don't really know the gene involved in this. Thank you. Reentry, this is the commonest mechanism of arrhythmia. Concept of reentry is very old. It was started in the early 1900s. 
So what do we do? Let's say we take a tissue, circular tissue, and it was tested on jellyfish, and I put an electrical signal here. Electrical current will go in both direction, and it will collide in the middle, and then disappear. Nothing will happen. However, let's say I block it here by some pressure or some mechanism and put an electric current here. Electricity will not be able to go this way. It will come this way. And then by the time it reaches this point, if there is a tissue has recovered, it can go round and round and produce a reentrant arrhythmia. And this is the commonest mechanism of arrhythmia um, in our practice. Um, and it can be big reentry. That means you can have a huge big circuit involving the whole atrium, or it can be micro reentry in a small part of the atrium or the ventricle. So let's look at this, how this happens. This is the tachycardia. Um, even though this is reported as sinus tachycardia, we have discussed this before. This is a uh, ventricular tachycardia, relatively narrow keyword is ventricular tachycardia and rate of 135 beats per minute. Um, same patient, a little bit slower rate. Uh, so what, what can happen? The reentry can happen because there is an anatomic barrier or we can develop a functional barrier. Functional barrier concept is a little difficult to understand, but it is possible. Anatomic barrier will be, I'll give a perfect example will be, let's say, uh, we'll come back to this. And this anatomic barrier can be physiological or pathological. Let's say we have in the right atrium, we have inferior vena cava and we have tricuspid valve. And both of them are electrically non-conducting and you can have electric current going between these two up along the wall of the septum and then come, I'm doing it in reverse way. It can go around or the other way around. And that's a natural anatomic barrier. That's the mechanism of atrial flutter. On the other hand, we can have a scar tissue due to myocardial infarct. Let's say these are the infarct tissue and these are healthy tissue. Now, what happens if this healthy tissue conduction is slow, you can have electricity going down the normal myocardial and go slowly through this pathway and come out and then produce this keyword is complex and then go back and come out again, produce the next one, and that's the mechanism of ventricular tachycardia. So how does antiremic drugs work? What we do, we give antiremic drugs, we block this pathway. How does ablation work? I can take a catheter. If I can find this focus, easier said than done, you can actually ablate this location and it will stop the tachycardia. So this is a scar-related ventricular tachycardia. Um, there is another that's common arrhythmia that is present, um, is when people undergo atrial septal defect by the old technique, they will cut the atrium and they will produce a scar tissue. You can develop an atrial tachycardia around that scar. And so when you go back, you can find the scar and ablate it. So the other reentry can happen in the bundle branch. So let's say electricity is going down to the right bundle and then comes back through the left bundle, producing a left bundle morphology tachycardia, which is more common or go Around, around that, or you can produce reentry inside these fascicles. So the bundle branch reentry is more common, uh, left bundle type. It is more common in dilated cardiomyopathy patients with some conduction tissue defect. And interesting, good thing about it is that if we understand the mechanism, treatment is very good, easy. If we can ablate the right bundle, I can stop the tachycardia. And that's why the understanding of mechanism of this tachycardia is very important. So then I, this is a very uh, big slide. We can have reentry in the sinus node. We can produce sinus node reentry and tachycardia. And what happens? The POA morphology will be exactly same as sinus B. So the first ECG that I showed, if the POA morphology was similar to the sinus, I could have said most probably this is sinus node reentry. And what we can do, we can go and ablate part of the sinus or try medication. Sinus node reentry is more common in elderly people. Um, it has no clinical significance except that it's a nuisance. You can have reentry within the AV node. Even though AV node we have draw, we always draw the circular structure. It's a little bit bigger structure, and you can produce reentry around the AV node. You can produce atrioventricular reentry using an accessory pathway. And look at this. 
And if I have a re-entry in the AV node, the electricity will go back to the atrium and into the ventricle at the same time. That's why the P wave will be inside the QRS complex most of the time. On the other hand, if you look at this arrhythmia, that we electricity goes down to the AV node, produces the QRS complex, then goes into the atrium. So the P wave will be after the QRS complex. There are exceptions, but this is how it happens. Atrial fibrillation is different. It's a totally different ball game. The theory is that there are a lot of micro reentry circuit in all over the atrium. Um, and that's why they're difficult to treat, difficult to ablate. If you have a single reentrant circuit and you can find it, you can ablate it much more easy than um, atrial fibrillation. So this is um, tachycardia. Um, this, um, You can see the narrow QRS tachycardia at a rate of uh, about 100, slightly over 150. And I think there is a P wave immediately behind the QRS complex and within 80 milliseconds. How do I know this is P wave? It's something that we don't normally see. And when the patient converts after adenosine, sorry, I didn't put the um, normal side. Um, when the patient converts, you cannot see it. So how does it happen? The AV node can have slow pathway. As I told you, this is pictured as a round structure. If you know, it is not a round structure. There are a lot of extension here. That is the area that can go slowly. So if there is a atrial bit, a premature bit, this is a sinus bit. It comes down, goes to the fast pathway, blocks into the slow pathway because fast pathway goes faster. Now, if there is a premature bit, what can happen? The premature bit can block in the fast pathway, go down through the slow pathway. Why does it do that? Because fast pathway has faster, longer refractory period. So it goes down. So the, here nothing happened. However, if this electricity could go backward, if the pathway is open, it could go and then keep going round and round, producing avinodre and tachycardia. And treatment will be that I can take medicine to slow down one of the most likely the slow pathway, or I can put a catheter around this location and ablate here. So we're going to modify the slow pathway and tachycardia can stop. So this is a re-entry. This is the very common re-entry mechanism. Now what happened with this one? This is another narrow QRS tachycardia. You can see um, that there is possible PA wave, of course, half his will question, so oh, the UEP doctors always make things up. We do make stories up to make it palatable. Uh, so here is something that is consistently present. And so there is a RP and PR tachycardia. And the same patient, when it converts to sinus rhythm, you can see there is delta wave, there is pre-excitation. So that is an atrioventricular entity. How does it happen? It happens electricity goes down through the normal pathway producing a narrow QRS and then come back, produce the net to get P wave sooner. If it goes the other way around, antidromic tachycardia, you will have wide QRS supraventricular tachycardia. And then it becomes very confused, can look almost like ventricular tachycardia. Atrial flutter. This is another um, common, um, it's kind of interesting that it's very common in the United States. For some reason, I in Bangladesh, it is not as common. In Bangladesh, fibrillation is more common than flutter. I don't know about Nepal or India, but this is a sawtooth appearance. What happens? The mechanism is, this is the inferior vena cover, and over here will be the tri IVC tricuspid annulus. The electricity goes down along the lateral wall of the right atrium, and then comes back up through the septum, producing the typical atrial flutter. If it goes the, this way, it will produce atypical atrial flutter. So this is a macro reentry circuit. Again, this is one arrhythmia that is very easily curable and with almost 100% success of ablation if you ablate the tricus, I, IVC tricuspid annulus to the, sorry, IVC to the um, tricuspid annulus location and uh, it can be done. Now, there is another type, as I told you that people who undergo atrial septal defective pair, they produce, they cut that, the old technique would, that they would cut the atrium and suture it. Problem is, they now have left a tissue here, which is healthy, and this is a scar around which 
you can produce re-entry circuit. Now, what the surgeons nowadays do, they will bring this line to the IVC. So the newer technique, they, they will always draw a line from here. So you don't have that opening to produce the re-entry circuit. And this is, a, um, we can do electronic mapping, we can define the circuit, we can find where the slow conduction narrow zone is. One thing about ablation that I'll tell you that you have to find a critical area where you can do it. I'll go back to this picture. This is for the younger doctors. Look at this. If I do ablation here, what will happen? The circuit will only move around it. However, if I do a line from this to the IVC, then there is no way. It is a narrow area, number one, and this is where the critical isthmus is. So when we do ablation, the time that is spent is finding that critical narrow area where this electricity is going through and ablate it. So um, I'm going to um, stop this part of the lecture. If there's any question, I, I will take it. And I'm going to change the slide. Um, any questions? Hi. <clears throat> Me, Dr. Salam. Yes, please welcome. Yes, sir. Sir, nice to see you, sir, again. I was a bit late. I have a question that is in case of device closure of HD, uh, HD uh, I had a patient who uh, presented with syncope and followed by conversion. And we found incidentally after echo, there is a big hole that is a, a, a receptor defect. And patient was admitted in ICBD and uh, subsequently we went for a neurological evaluation. Is there any focus of epilepsy? But uh, fortunately, it was not there. And then we went for device closure uh, and successfully the patient uh, improved and further subsequently on follow-up, we did not found any syncope, any atrial flutter of evolution. So uh, my question is, uh, surgeon is cutting and suturing, and but we are putting uh, some uh, foreign bodies, but how this uh, arrhythmia has uh, reverted to normal? This is my question. Well, uh, thank you for the nice question. First of all, the question is, the surgeons open the chest. Um, this patient's syncope, um, we have, you have never diagnosed the etiology. So we don't know the etiology of this. Um, because if we look at it, by definition, an actual septal defect cannot cause syncope. It can cause stroke or other symptoms. So um, that's one. Um, so, of course, the ASD closure now, uh, as you pointed out, that a uh, lot of them can be closed by um, the closed technique, uh, transvenous um, technique. But uh, still, a good number will still end up needing open, open surgery. Um, this group, actually, we have seen arrhythmia with this group also. The problem with this group is that once they have arrhythmia around the septal um, occluder, uh, you can't go and, and try to ablate it because you have a foreign body there and uh, it, it'll be uh, and metals and you, you may end up damaging those. So if they develop arrhythmia, we are kind of in, in a bad situation. But Rohibai, his, his question was how it prevents arrhythmia in future. I think we can reasonably say that because of the high flow there is with the atrial septal difficulty, there is atrial remodeling, atrial size goes up. And it becomes like a substrate. The more the a shunt, the atrial dilatation, more the arrhythmias. So once we close that, it reverses that uh, remodeling phenomena enlargement, and then probably uh, beneficial in the long run. Yes, no, no question about it. But the question is, in this particular patient, we have no proof. What are yeah. the etiology of syncope? That is the problem. But but no question about it. That if there is atrial stretching there will be arrhythmia in future. Um, uh, and that can actually uh, cause problems. So uh, by uh, doing the ASD closers, we are probably helping the heart um, and preventing unnecessary stretching. Thank you. Anybody else, any question? Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes, sir? I can hear you, Sadi. Sir, sir, I want to know one thing. Uh, three days back, one patient in our hospital presented with acute uh, uh, clockwise counterclockwise flutter 
yes. three times attempted with a diff, a synchronized defibrillation uh, with about 200 joule, but three times, despite of three times defibrillation, uh, the shock failed. Ultimately, uh, Dr. Mohsin terminated the flutter by ablation. My question is why the three times synchronized shock failed to terminate the flutter? Yeah. So the question is why did not flutter terminate? Did you do the cardio version or somebody else did it? The cardio version, sir. And who, who did it? You did it or somebody else? We, we are present there. Okay. Did it, con okay. did it convert at all? You see, this is what it is. Cardio version not converting, I do a large number, is extremely rare, especially at trail flutter. Number one is the placement of the pads. Where are you putting the paddles? In Bangladesh, I'm sure you use the paddles. We use pads. We put it anterior posterior. I am yet to see a flutter that did not convert. But it is possible that sometimes they will convert and then go back within a within one bit or two bit, they can go back to the flutter again. So um, a new onset flutter, we always cardiovert. Uh, we are always, it's extremely rare for flutter not to work. Um, and the other thing is, was it a monophasic shock or biphasic shock? We have devices with external 360 biphasic, but most flutters stop with low energy shock if the pads are rightly placed. So that will be the why I will look into the where the pads are. Um, we always do our own cardio version. Um, and the thing about doing this thing is that um, it, it's a small procedure, but uh, the uh, cardio versions are always done by physicians in, in over here. Thank you. Any anybody else? Hafiz, you want to take over, or do you want me to do something else? I don't know how much time I we have. You have time, so. Uh, um, I request I have to go, um, and if you don't mind, uh, thank you all. And Hafiz, you have slides, ready? Yeah. Okay. Hafiz will um, um, I take over, and then we'll I'll see you next week. I'll stay until uh, another few minutes. So. Sir, uh, can I ask you a question, sir? Sure. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> following EP RFA ablation, yeah. uh, what do you is see the, my slides? Uh, oh, let me let me stop. Uh, I have stopped, right? Yes. Can you see my slide see now? Slide. No, not yet. No, sir. Okay. Go ahead, Tushar. Sir, following radio frequency ablation, the scar we uh, make inside. What is the chance of re-entry around that scar? Oh. Any uh, ablation? Sure. So the question is, um, what is the chance of, if you do a vinod re tachycardia ablation, it should be a single spot ablation, and that should not produce a scar, big scar. If you do in children, young kids, then actually a one millimeter lesion can go up to a one centimeter in, uh, when they reach adulthood. So that can produce scar. Um, and the, one of the typical example, what you were mentioning happens with AFib ablation because that's more extensive left atrial ablation. And you are drawing many lines and there are actually tachycardia going around those curves, just like the ASD um, incision. Um, and you have to, sometimes you have to go back and uh, reablate those areas, find out where, where it is happening because you'll see that a lot of AFib patients will go into actual tachycardia after ablation. So you, you have not those. But for WPW syndrome, for avinodry and I I don't think that's an issue, or focal atrial tachycardia. And that should not be an issue. Uh, so in, in many cases of WPW, we have to ablate a quite long uh, area, as if no. the course is, uh, as its course uh, is sometimes oblique. So that does it uh, produce a scar that can, in the okay. future, produce a re entry? Oblique WPW pathway is not very common. So, 
if you not are concept, mapping, but... if you are spending enough time, you can find the location. And uh, my our practice is to minimize as few ablation as possible. Most of WPW syndrome, if you not re-enter in tachycardia, we will give one to two ablations at best. There are very few. So that's why you have to be patient during EP study. You, you sit and sit and find the location um, where the, uh, the ablation is going to work and then ablate. And that's where it comes uh, to the mapping part. Um, and okay. there is, of course, always a tendency, oh, I have found the pathway, let's ablate as quickly as possible. That will, that will uh, lead to giving too many ablations. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Can you see my uh, screen now? We can see your we can see your screen, but not the slides. Oh, um, can you see my now? No, we can see the list, ECG, basic beyond all those things, but not the main picture. Oh, um, you want to double course. click on that? No. How about now? Black screen. Oh yes, it's coming up now. Okay, good. So uh, this is a 40 year old. Uh, I Some of the EKGs, I call it the, you know, when you go to a restaurant and they say, catch up the uh, day, the fish, <laughs> in your yes. Maryland, uh, Maryland uh, Harbor side, the catch up yes. this day. So this is the catch up the day. 40-year-old uh, female with uh, complaint of chest pain and called EMS. She takes uh, Losartan for hypertension. And the EMS found her in chest pain. And in front of them, patient went into a rhythm like this and lost consciousness. Like this. What's that? Sorry? Like so, patient lost consciousness and then went into this. Rafik Bhai, will you call it? Torsad or we we'll call it VF? I'll call it VF because you know it's, you can really make the head and tail of it. Um, I'll call this uh, ventricular fibrillation. So they, I mean, if it, they gave one shock and then patient came around and was um, returned of circulation, was talking some kind of chest pain and then EKG, sorry about the quality of the tracing. And then EKG, you know, some ST elevation in the precordial leads that is immediately after a repeat B, you can see the B EKGs. And then patient came to the ER and then EKG in the ER. So no family history of sudden cardiac death. Patient had never any cardiac history before, hypertension and, and this story. So Jamil Bhai, any, so, and of course the emergency room doctor wanted uh, STEMI activation. Uh, <laughs> and that is right. Yeah. The first case is in, in this case, the A. And the V1 and V2 looks like looks same like some ST elevation, right? ST but elevation then... with concavity up. Yeah. In V2 somewhat uh, saddle type. Yeah. Elevation. But look at the QT. Yeah. QT is uh QT seems QT to be less is... than half. 
or the yeah I, qt is okay and in case in case i don't see the st elevation the er doctor put arrow mark in lead 23 avf see that they put that there is st segment depression in okay. case in case i miss it <laughs> <laughs> it's due to undulation of the baseline and okay. then and then you can look at the b uh, ekg uh, b and then ekg c the bottom line is that uh, what do we do next and that was the question so i was called uh, in and and what uh, we do next? can i make yeah. a comment yeah if you go back please so this patient never had chest pain right no patient complained the emergency medical service for chest pain emergency chest medical pain. service when they oh. arrived they were uh -huh. talking and <laughs> okay <laughs> that made it difficult so you can't blame the er doctor to call you i mean it's a concave ST elevation um one of the uh, two issues one acute ischemic event versus is it brugada brugada can have dynamic ekg change but how do you explain the lateral t wave changes subsequently it's very difficult yeah. just by brugada right so it, but, it, the, the ecgc in lead v2 v3 v4 there is t wave change now yes and then in the leads uh, ekg c the uh, the t wave inversion is kind of a biphasic in exactly exactly but I would actually ask everybody to uh, pay attention to um, Rovik Vai's uh, reflex that he was asking about patient. And also when I said chest pain, he, did you hear his reaction? That this is important, that EKG we always interpret and, and, and take context. care of the patient. Yeah, clinical context. Yeah. So uh, we always need, to, I wanted to emphasize that there are many reasons for ST elevation and certainly you can look at Brugada, but look at the, so ST elevation is not ST elevation MI. ST elevation, MI part is clinical. EKG does not give MI diagnosis, but by certain pattern in the EKG, we jump for MI. But it is important for the, we have to pass board. I know that, but we have patients to look at. So if you look at this from the left to the right, the left ventricular hypertrophy, left bundle branch block, acute pericarditis, look at this last uh, concave upwards. Then you can have pseudo infarction pattern and hyperkalemia. You can have, you can have the, Entered real anteroceptal MI. Yes, you can read STEMI despite right bundle. You, you can. And then this uh, Brugada. Look at this Brugada pattern is the shoulder down. And we see this in acidosis, hyperkalemia, and uh, other non cardiac issues. And therefore, we follow the criteria, but still remember the clinical context. So, oh, so what do we do for this patient? Anyone to, uh, I, you know that I did take the patient to the cath lab, but anyone uh, have any other thought? Will you take the cath patient to the cath lab yes, right then? Yes. Or yes, will you yes. wait, wait for? I, I, I'll take to the cath lab. I'll do that. Because the patient had cardiac arrest with VF. Yeah. So, so it's I'll mandatory to look at the coronaries. Yes. This is very important. What both our uh, faculty said, that this is important that you don't waste time. But you may take to the cath lab, but you may have another kind of problem. So here we here you go. See the LAD, meat segment stenosis, and, uh, and then others, look at that. You can see the You can see the coronaries. There's also, uh, there's six, so six, six, what, six, what do we do now? And then I did um, the right also. 
these are all boring. Um, so I gave lots of nitroglycerin. In fact, I gave, uh, just to tell uh, what would I give, a <laughs> lot of nitroglycerin intercoronary. I also gave uh, intercoronary nicardipine. And I also went uh, through phase by phase whether there is any change in systole versus diastole. Because two things comes in mind. Is it a myocardial breach or is it a coronary spasm? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, just to show you for completeness, this is the right coronary artery. So what do we do now? The patient had a B-fever as chest pain, EKG changes, and then So I thought that why not do a ventriculogram to see whether this is a Takasubu or not. Okay. So I did a ventriculogram and uh, what, what now what after this, what to do? And I hope that Rufik Bhai can stay. I know he has another talk because there is some EP issue will come up in a second. Jamil Bhai, what to do next? Any? Um, uh, you have shown the um, uh, left um, anterior descending after right. injecting uh, nicardipin. Yeah, so there was no change. No change, okay. So what we did is I put an FFR, uh, IFR wire. Okay. And, uh, and then I got the IFR 0 0.92, 0 0.91. This is the volcano <laughs> system. And now I'm on the fence. So you will start with intermediate lesion and then we do IFR, you are in the intermediate zone. So uh, what do you do now? Uh, should I put an IVAS or, so what I did, I did an adenosine three minutes infusion, 140 mics per kilo. And then uh, I FFR now, fractional flow reserve now, 0.97. That's significant. And uh, what the, the LV function was normal. So what do you do now? Just a dilemma because so, the patient have cardiac arrest, head history of cardiac arrest. It's in a cardiac arrest, yes. But where is the MI? There is no, I don't see any MI. So I don't know uh, whether this is right or wrong, but I did a uh, stent at this point. One of my colleagues who did not know the case, he made an excellent comment. He said, after the FFR, IFR. After the IFR, I would not have done FFR. But if you did, if you put the stent, you are right. If you don't put the stent, I would also say you are right. <laughs> so I did the so I did the stent. I did the stent. Okay. And then I did the F IFR again. So now the IFR, which was 0 0.9192, it was 0 0.98. Okay. And it looks nice. And then question is. What do we do next? So now the question to Rafik Bai that is this, because we cannot call it MI related, if it is primary BF, we don't put a ICT, right? We, we just treat the MI. So now how I define this, look at the troponins. This is 250, 361, 34. These are the fifth generation troponin, high sensitivity. So. Roughly, you divide them by thousand. That's 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 your 0 0.254, 0 0.361, 0 0.34. Echo normal LV function. Couple of chest pain. L blood pressure control patient is doing fine. So what should I do next? Profi uh, probably has left. Uh, DC discharge home with dual interplated statin blood pressure control or give wearable jacket, life vest, medications, or put ICD before going home? I put the life vest. Okay, but you then buy time for three months. Yeah. yeah. And then see how long you'll do this. 
I'll put oh, money. I'll go for that. But I would be asking the patient again: Was she taking any uh, medic, anything else, any antihistamine or anything else that can have induced that arrhythmia? Okay. Okay. So um, interesting. We did toxic screen. Toxic screen was negative. Liver function test. Everything was negative. The pharmacy that she goes to and takes losartan, we actually checked with that pharmacy if she was taking any other medications because patient denied any other medications and pharmacy confirmed that she was not taking anything. And we actually told her that this is a serious issue. Is there any confounding issue that you taking be truthful to us? And she said that she was not. So what we thought was that this is a secondary prevention following the VP arrest. So this will be too high risk to let her go home without a device. And, uh, and our um, electrophysiology guy, he initially thought that ischemic substance good enough. When I told him that I'm not totally convinced that this is enough to protect her. Um, so she got um, sub -Q, subcutaneous ICD for aesthetic reason and did fine. So, um, uh, another patient, um, uh, if I have time quickly, uh, 58 year old, came in with um, syncope, uh, shortness of breath, some back pain, and she was in another hospital, then left against medical advice and came to our hospital. And this is the EKG in our hospital. And this is little tough one, but quite interesting. The EKG sinus rhythm, we see ST elevation in 2, 3 AVF, also V4, V5, V6, and maybe in lead one. There is some EKG that V1, V2, little bit of ST depression, and that was confounding, telling us that this patient may have acute coronary, but we debated. I actually told the on-call team because I got a copy that look at the v AVR, that there is a PR elevation. So PR elevation and maybe more than one territory, it could be pericarditis, acute pericarditis, but question is why? So the, and in the meantime, patient dropped blood pressure. So if the patient drops blood pressure and EKG changes, I tell the fellows, that I want two things, a, a, a stat chest X-ray and bedside echo is a must. And this is the chest X-ray. Looks like big heart, but lung feels not flooded with severe congestion, right? Relatively protected lung. So, and then this is the repeat EKG and I show you the echo. So any comment on the echo, but uh, LV function is not normal. Um, and I give you these uh, issues with the labs in other hospitals and, and our read, but look at this echo that was done by the tech later, maybe you did an hour apart. So this is the best one. Any comment on the echo? There is some uh, collection around the heart. In the yes. So, so and, and, and look at that. And, and why like uh, some organized are... material yeah. In, yeah. The, in, the, in the heart. So yeah. uh, we did look at this and we did the tamponade physiology. And, you know, uh, fellows sometimes um, argue about, you know, across mitral valve, the respiratory variation, you know, is it 25% or across the tricuspid valve, is it 40%? I say that, remember the tamponade phys physiology in the presence of hypotension may not meet those criteria. And in the presence of 
intracardiac shunt, you may not have tamponade physiology. Yeah. In the presence of severe AI, you may not have tamponade physiology. In the presence of severe bleed, particularly in the trauma, we are level one trauma, patient has severe hypovolemia, blood loss and chest trauma, tamponade, but you may not see tamponade physiology, but you may see the collection. So uh, because of that, uh, we said, okay, uh, we do um, the, the uh, convince the uh, surgeon for a pericardial window, but for the sake of time, I'm skipping this, but look at the, uh, all the coronaries are okay. But look at this tracing. This tracing is important because it is a simultaneous left ventricular end diastolic pressure and right ventricular end diastolic pressure. There is equalization of the pressure. Another thing we do is the inspiration and expiration and see whether there is any dyssynchrony or synchrony, you know, restrictive and constrictive. But in any case, this was uh, equalization of the pressure you can see. And then uh, the patient went for, the patient went for um, pericardial window and unfortunately also had anemia we had to transfuse and then uh, stabilize the patient. Um, this, if you ask me about whether we do routine um, pericardial uh, uh, window or we do routine tap or we do routine this hemodynamics. Morton Kern, where I used to work with, he would love you if you do the right and left cat with a pericardial uh, tamponade patient. But honestly, we are kind of lazy. We don't do it. We just do the ultrasound guided, sometimes uh, pericardial um, tap. One thing lately I have seen very helpful is that we use a micropuncture needle and use the micropuncture needle. And I'm actually pretty confident now to do it apical versus sub -xiphoid. So you decide where the fluid is most and then use micropuncture needle. It's pretty, pretty safe actually to go that way with the, with the guidance of the ultrasound. But if you are in the pericardial cavity, uh, before you do anything, inject a micro bubble, get some fluid out first. Um, so that was good. So, and then we talk about EKG all the time, but I will finish with this one. Um, if you have any comment, see the patient presented with 64 year old, um, lethargy, fatigue, STEMI activation. So what do you do? In this patient, widespread ST depression in different uh, uh, coronary arteria and ST lesion AVR. One possibility, even without chest pain, is left pain disease. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would definitely agree with that. And then question is, what we do? So, um, funny enough that something was done and this EKG was there. In about six hours post. Severe anemia. Severe anemia, correct. <laughs> so, so severe anemia. Global so, ischemia. Yeah, global ischemia. So uh, the, the uh, question is, now what you do? Troponin came small positive. Echo LV function low normal. Do a stress test in this patient if you are thinking of uh, uh, ischemic uh, coronary artery disease? After correction of the hemoglobin? Yes. I would go for a stress test. Okay. 
Yeah. And if that indicates, then I'll go for cap. Okay. A stress test came normal, but okay. fixed inferior defect. And with, you know, I don't know uh, what's your uh, impression with the nuclear cardiology read. Sometimes the nuclear, I call it unclear. And, uh, and it becomes a... <laughs> It becomes a little mumbo jumbo. So yes. I usually try to do, and particularly, you know, uh, no offense, if the nuclear uh, tests, nuclear stress test is read by the radiologist, it becomes a nightmare sometimes because not everybody is same and they don't look at the clinical context. So their read sometimes can be problematic. So um, what do you do? What was the ejection fraction post uh, transfusion? Before and after, good point. I actually, I called it like low normal before, but uh, after no major issues. So if uh, no viability, normal, then follow up the patient. So, <laughs> you know, the funny thing is that this patient, um, echo EF, and then the fellow was telling me the EF, and then stress test is done, but I hear a murmur. And I said, echo normal, but what about the aortic valve? Did you look at the, the, the they got the preliminary from the techn, techn, technician, and then they got the EF normal, but they missed the whole point that this, this was a severe AS with the, with the bicuspid aortic valve. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and then LV function was okay. So we did, uh, so now LV function normal, but severe AS, GI source is likely, you know, could be Hades. Um, you need the GI workup, but the GI doesn't want to do the um, GI workup because they said that you fix the valve first, then we'll do the GI workup. So, what will you do? Troponin. Troponin was positive because the thing is the mind. They are afraid because the GI doesn't want to do anything. What was the BNP? BNP, I don't remember, but it was not that high, like a couple of hundred. Creatine, luckily, is normal. So I usually call the anesthesia. I said, what do you, what you are afraid? Because the issue is not with the GI doctor. Issue is with the anesthesia. So I call the anesthesia that look, look at the, read the echo along with me. So you will be okay. Just give uh, the sedation that is, that does not drop the blood pressure. You'll be fine. So patient had this, there was some uh, angiodysplasia, but no active bleed, hemoglobin stabilized. And vast majority of the, the patients, they get better with the uh, replacement of the valve. So, and the, we did the cath. By the way, we ended up doing the cath. Coronaries were fine, but the valve was indeed tight. And then uh, it was a happy, happy ending. So that's all we have. Any comments? So first, but, uh, I think first, first patient. So what is the risk of uh, strain fracture if we put a strain in uh, myocardial breeze? No, I, I don't think this was myocardial breach because I try not to put any stents in the myocardial breach. But if you, for the best thing to do for the myocardial breach is to go frame by frame and then see whether there is any phasic variation in systole and diastole. So we did not see any myocardial breach. And we see fixed obstruction. Question is, is it a localized fixed obstruction with severe spasm? Uh, and in a severe spasm, you can have fixed obstruction. So we give nitroglycerin and then nicardipine, but we did not see anything changed. And, uh, and then uh, in, the, in the case of uh, myocardial bridge, actually, Dr. Karn has published, if you do the IFR, or the uh, wire, uh, leave the wire, you can actually see the changes in the number 
uh, of the IFR values with the phases, systole and diastole as well, if it is severe. But you are right, um, uh, Arun, that we don't, we do, we try not to give stents because the chances of a stent fracture is, is bad. Sometimes we see, and we have done a couple of cases, at least in my hospital, that they are associated with hokum and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and some of the and the, L, the LAD runs through the fibers. So we tell the surgeons if they go going for myectomy. We just had one on Friday that take this, uh, go through that area, and then lift the myocardial fibrils and relieve them. But for that alone, I have not sent anybody to OR. Any other comments? Actually, in this case actually proves the importance of clinical context. Absolutely. Uh, can I share my experience today? Yeah. I had a patient referred from another hospital. Uh, she had a, uh, the patient became unconscious. He had trauma, he is a post bypass patient. He had some trauma in his ankle, did not pay attention to it, but then he developed fever, slight fever at night when going to bed. And at the dead of night, he had severe fever and became unconscious. He was taken to a hospital. They had given him some antibiotic. They found out that he had raised troponin and there was so much audit that the patient had MI and they referred to me. I find out even when the tropi was high sensitive tropi actually, it was high, uh, not that high. Again, the patient had at that time ejection fraction of 55% post bypass patient. And the procal was very high. I said, this is the case of septicemia. The patient didn't complain of any chest pain. This is very likely septicemia induced myocardial injury. This is not non STMI. So pay, don't pay attention to that. Just treat the infection. And he is hemodynamically stable. Continue the present medication. Don't give too much anticoagulant, etc. Now the patient is quite all right. <laughs> quite all right. And I was saying that I'm not going to do any cancer or anything. Just treat the infection, go home. Then after a week, I will do the ETT. If there is something wrong in there, only then I will go for get. You, you, are, you don't have any cardiac issues so far, I see. And actually, we looked at our critical care patients when we published. If you look at the critical care patients and then sepsis across board, if the troponin remains less than one, I call it mini troponin. So there is no typical rise and fall, less than one, an LV function normal, the chances of, because we followed them through the cat lab, the chances of any hemodynamically significant coronary stenosis is little, is very low. However, if the troponin is more than five, even if it is non-related to uh, coronary disease, down the line, if you do cath, they may have uh, significant coronary disease, may not be necessarily MI, but high grade stenosis. What happens that these are like a complex group with type two. So when there is a demand supply mismatch, they get more troponin, but a very, very small troponin is a good thing with normal LV function. And you have time, you can evaluate them later. Hafiz Bhai. Yeah. Professor Abdul Salam, I have yeah. a little comments regarding your last case. Yeah. yeah. It was a probably a bicuspid aortic bulb with some uh, aortic stenosis and as well as regurgitation. So, and patient presented with anemia. So, exclude any subacute or acute bacterial endocarditis in this case because uh, um, in case of chronic or subacute or acute bacterial endocarditis, usually predisposed with congenital um, valvular yep. associated with anemia. So, yep. uh, that is, my, that is my point to uh, uh, that is my point to discuss. Yes, absolutely, a, a very important point because that can be subacute uh, bacterial endocarditis with marrow suppression, and then is the anemia because of that or anemia with the GI bleed? Uh, that's why if there is nothing in the GI, 
and then blood cultures, you pay attention. We actually did the um, TE also, and there was no uh, um, valvular vegetation or anything. Um, for, for some reason, um, because the bicuspid aortic valve, the aortopathy may be common. So uh, we, we did not only the um, uh, TE, we, we also did the um, CT angio, make sure that there is no associated quark and the, and the valve replacement alone is good enough. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm good. Uh, what is, I think we're already late night, about 11. Uh, I think we have uh, had good experience with different type of ECGs in different scenarios. Uh, and uh, we enjoyed that very much. And today, the lecture was supposed to be given by Professor Atahar Ali, as we have known, that his mother is very ill on life support due to COVID. At the end of this today's program, let us all together pray for Professor Atahar Bhai's mother so that she gets well very soon. And let's pray to God Almighty that all of us remain in good health so that we can meet again in the next week. Uh, the topic of the next week will be, uh, we'll be deciding later on, depending upon the situation, <laughs> There, whether all of us are remaining well or not. Thank you, Hafiz Bhai. Rivu, uh, thank you. Give us the we'll give out the instruction later on for the next class. Okay. So, thank you again, Beximko and Rivu, and the faculties and everyone who are here and all the thank you all. who has been joining us regularly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And good night. Good, good night. night. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.